The EMEA says the North is in such a bad place today because it hasn't sufficiently invested in education. The EMEA of Kano, Mohamed Dusanusi, says policies like quota system and federal character have done more harm to Nigeria's northern region than good over the years. Sanusi, who made the remarks at the 60th birthday celebration of the Kaduna State Governor Nasser El Rafai in Kaduna, said in trying to implement affirmative action to allow the North catch up with the more developed and well of South, the region has emerged worse off. The Emir added that investing in quality education across the 19 northern states is the only way to save the region from endemic poverty and underdevelopment. Joining me in the studio is an education consultant, Chinenye Mbauzuku. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining me. And of course, uh, we have uh, the regional head of program, Stitch for Nigeria, Ahmed Alaga. Pleasure to have you join us. Thank you very much. Okay, gentlemen, um, what Sanusi is saying, uh, let's just get your reaction, start with your reaction. I think that um, to a very great extent, um, his statement is actually in order. If you consider since when um, this policy has been in place for over 40 years and um, how much progress has been made as a result of the reasons why it was, uh, um, you know, the policy was placed. You'll notice that uh, the Northern region has suffered a lot in terms of um, the quality. And um, primarily you, uh, uh, with young children trying to get into uh, primary school who are accepted not on the same standards as kids in other parts of Nigeria, you find a huge gap in terms of uh, what their interest is and what output they get from the education system. Uh, I'd say that um, um, the initial intent in which it was set up was ideal at that point in time. Um, however, times have changed. We now live in the 21st century and uh, the demands for the 21st century requires a lot of things, including merit. Um, this is the era of the do. Um, so when you have a system that adopts or admits children into school because of where they come from and not check in if they actually qualify for admission, sets a whole ball of, um, uh, of challenges, including ability to survive in that same system. Um, whereas kids from the other parts of Nigeria who have been selected into the program meritoriously uh, come in at the right level uh, and are able to survive. And I can tell you it plays out not just at the primary level but all the way to the university. Uh, I can remember back in the days when I was trying to get admission into a federal college. I know one of the things they told me was that um, I belong to what was called ONS, which is other northern states, which meant that um, for that particular course, uh, they had stipulated a specific percentage of people, people yeah. uh, who from the northern region will be qualified. And uh, ONS, which means if you're not from the northern state, uh, a certain percentage will be allocated to you. Even if I, even as I had the qualification to fit right for that program. And I can tell uh, from my personal experience the gap that had put in place. And um, uh, you, you, could, you can tell uh, what the outcome is. And I know that very well because I speak for myself. Uh, those of us who came into the program with the right you know, entry requirements are those who, are, who have survived today. So for decades, uh, that system has encouraged favoritism, nepotism, which are the dangers of the fabric of this vibrant culture of Nigeria that we all hold. It, 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 from what he's saying, it doesn't seem to be fixing the problem at all. Rather, it's um, escalating it. Isn't it time we put a stop to it? And if we are to do that, what could be um, the ramifications? So uh, my, my view is that the... Um you know, they're, they're, we have to take the long view of everything in order to, you know, you kind of like look at the past in order to chart the future. And, um, and in this particular case, th um, this is affirmative action. That's what it was intended to be, affirmative action. The question is, is, did we set the metrics for measuring what that affirmative action is actually achieving? 
and have we followed it through over the past uh, maybe 40, 40, um, 40 years or 50 years of, of Nigeria to determine whether or not it's the right move and are we, are we adjusting it? What has happened instead seems like we've, we've put a policy in place and we've held that policy, whether or not the reality on ground, whether the statistics that are coming out are showing that the, the, uh, the, the policy is actually working. The, the truth of the matter is that um, from, a, from a long view, education in Nigeria has been, has been in, in, I don't know, some people call it decline, I call it complete collapse. Um, the, the data that, that we see tells us clearly that we really do not have a functional education system in this country. Um, even worse is that public education, which is where the bulk of the children actually, actually are, uh, are supposed to be catered to, is the uh, worst hit. It's so badly hit that it's, 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 it's a disaster zone with the result that private education has taken over. So the governments, many of the governments have abdicated their responsibility to provide education to children in the public sector, leaving the private sector to do that. So there's a correlation that I'm driving at. Where you have a strong private sector, you would find that education um, is kind of like being held up. Where you don't have a strong private sector and your reliance is on the public sector, then there's an, is a larger disaster. And typically you would find that there, since there's a, there's a heavy, um, there's a pretty strong private sector in the southern states of Nigeria and a not so strong um, private sector in the northern states of Nigeria. So the, not, the children of the north are at the mercy of the public education system, which has collapsed. So what is the way forward? I, I strongly believe that there must continue to be some kind of affirmative action, but it must be kind of like uh, re, re, uh, thought through. We have to think it through again and try to understand really what are the parameters and how do we measure that and how do we hold people accountable. We come back to that point, accountability. The fundamental truth is that in a Nigerian education system, there's only one player that is accountable and that's the student. There's no one else who either is penalized in one way or the other for the lack of success in the system. Everybody gets away with it except the child. And we, if we have a, a system where the entire society and the government abdicates its own responsibility but holds a child responsible and accountable to the, um, to the outcomes of the system, then clearly we must know that we're doing something that's really crazy. We have to step back and ask ourselves the question, do, child, do children have rights? If the constitution says yes, and the constitution makes education a fundamental right of every child, and we have failed to provide that right to the children, then why are we penalizing the children? We penalize them through ignorance, we penalize them through lack of uh, capacity to actually uh, be gainfully employed, we penalize them in terms of their ability to understand and to, and to assimilate into a civic society, we penalize them in terms of their future and their ability to earn income for themselves and to make themselves useful in society, we penalize them for being deviants, we call them all sorts of things, but all the adults who are really responsible for maintaining what has been put down as a constitutional right, everybody gets off free. And I challenge you to tell me one person, one adult, who has been penalized by this system for failing the Nigerian child. North, yeah. south, east, west, wherever, middle belt. Okay, that, that brings me, just to stay with you. Um, is it possible for us, uh, why is it there's uh, the, the tribalistic uh, tendencies, isn't it possible for us to look at it as a Nigerian problem other than a Northern problem? Because that seemed to be, um, putting them somewhat at a disadvantage because if you keep measuring them on, um, on the, that there are no, they cannot meet up, it's almost like saying they are less than the people of other region. So who is they um, and who is them? I mean, Nigeria is all of us and every child is, is our child. Mm -hmm. There is no distinction between a child that's born in any part of this country from the other, they ought not to be. But guess what, who puts the distinction, who is making this discrimination is the adults. So when we talk of the North, you know, we're talking about the myth. It's a political structure, a myth. It doesn't exist. The diversity in the North is even greater than the diversity in the Southern parts of the country. We have Northern states, which are administrative units. We have Southern states, which are administrative units. So in truth, there is no ethnic or tribal components to the story. What there is, is a rich tapestry of Nigeria's diversity and every single component of, that, of, that, of this country has its own idiosyncrasies, which you must accommodate in the overall um, uh, design of the education philosophy. Yeah. I mean, earlier you were talking about, uh, on your program, you were talking about the school for Boko Haram and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I'm like thinking, okay, so what's the issue? 
there's an ideology that drives Boko Haram. Does Nigeria have a counter ideology to replace that ideology? Why would people deviate into the ideology of a Boko Haram? It can only happen in the absence of a stronger, more coherent, a much more relevant, and a much more rewarding ideology. The failure of that ideology is what creates the, other, the opportunity for the other to take place. So in truth, when we look at the education system and we're trying to determine how do we ensure that every child has a right to education, our system must not only be affirmative towards those who are historically disadvantaged for various reasons, and there are many parts of Nigeria that have that problem, but it must also be affirmative towards a child who is exceptional for whatever circumstances. It doesn't matter whether he's from this part of the country or from that part of the country. Every child is unique. And in the 21st century, we, our goal is to enable the full potential of every single child. And we should not shy away from it. Yeah, I'm still going to ride on something you said about the uniqueness of each child's learning abilities. But before I come there, I want to ask you about um, a, a devising strategies, getting maybe other organizations. You talked about private sector uh, partnership, getting other organizations to come in. Isn't it possible that for the North, strategies can be implemented? You've worked there. What methods do you think would be better applied and that will be able to attract private investors to come and uplift education in that area? Well, I can tell you for certain that um, at Teach for Nigeria, one of the things we believe in is collective leadership. And that, um, just you said, uh, our vision is that every child deserves an excellent education, irrespective of her social, economic, or political background. Meaning that um, it doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, or you come from a Muslim or a Christian family. It's you, basically a human right. Yes, you deserve an excellent education. And one of the things we've also established is that we cannot do it alone. It's, it's, a, it's a systemic challenge that cannot be done alone. It requires a different method, a different way of thinking. And that is why uh, we said that uh, in the way we operate, we found out that leadership is a key factor. And to get that done, you need people. You need to lead people to achieve that outcome. And so, yes, in the way we work, we've identified that we have to work with government. I mean, we've had certain conversations where people have asked us that, I mean, uh, the biggest nightmare for any nonprofit working in particular, in this particular sector is actually working with the government. I think so far so good. We're one of the few nonprofits who have been able to manage that process. And that's because we strongly believe that we cannot do it without government. So um, we partner with government, we partner with other nonprofits who are in the same sector, we partner with corporate individuals who align to the vision. I think that the thing that would encourage more Nigerians to look forward to is having this a country where it's vision driven and that begins to separate some of the challenges that we have wondering if Nigeria is divided into six geopolitical parts or we have one common vision that we all see under that umbrella. And until we align to that point, we then begin to see that whatever happens up north will eventually happen down south. Or in most cases, like we're having recently, that uh, Boko Haram is now probably spreading all the way from the northern region to the southern region, because it's the reality. Uh, it's not just going to happen in the north alone. I mean, this antithesis happened because certain things have happened. Like Mr. Tuchini has said, there's a history of why this is happening. And until we go to that history point and begin to nip it in the board, uh, these challenges will not go away. And education, so far so good, seems to be the one solution that we've shied away from. Until we get that right, we will begin to move in the right direction. Talking about getting it right, one of the key things you talked, or you also talked about the the uniqueness of each child is for the right resource to be at the right place at the right time. Considering the quality of teachers we have now, how can we, you know, attract the right resource persons to help this? Because you might build a very fantastic system, and there are no people to drive it, which is one of the work you people are yeah. doing. How can we get this right set of brains to? go to where they are needed, not just to be in the profession, but to be where they are actually needed, to bring that set of people up to the standard of the South. 
Um, my, my answer to that would be, or uh, well, the beginning of an answer to that. I also want your response okay. on it after yeah. he's finished. Yeah. So, so the beginning of the answer to that, I think, is lies with breaking certain myths. We have myths that we hold on to, and we use those myths, and we, uh, and we kind of like rationalize our, our, our circumstances, and then we, 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 try to, we try to build strategies and solutions on top of those myths, and they can't, they get, they can't carry. An example would be the myth of when we say the North. What is the North? That's a myth, okay. right? So unless you take that apart, unless you deconstruct that myth and understand that there are states in the North and there are societies and communities in the North, there's a problem. Another myth, which is probably hidden, is uh, or unspoken probably, is a myth that, oh, you know, a Christian education gives, gives you an advantage over, um, over anybody else who may have on any other faith. But we forget that algebra started in, in countries that didn't have yeah, Christians. I, I, I agree coming, with the myth. coming to the okay. point, right? Coming right. to the point. So, when we talk about, and, and the third myth is around the question of what's the solution in education? And the solution, as a government is pursuing and has been pursuing, is to build more infrastructure. And that's a failure. You build more schools and nobody goes into those schools. The schools are empty. So okay. it isn't that. So, so we really need to be careful around the myths that we put about. So here's another myth. The myth is that we have resources available as teachers. It's a big myth. There are no teachers. The, the, the school, the states that have done proper assessments, there isn't any state that has done a proper assessment of teachers, particularly in basic education, that has come up with a figure of more than 22% qualification. Yeah, I of think all there is a consensus teachers. on that, that well, we don't have adequate resources. Well, if, if, my if, my if question, there, if, actually. If, if, if there's a consensus on that, then why is it that in JAM, the lower scores go to, the, go to those who are going to college of education and not question. the reverse? Yeah. Because if, if you really understand that and there's an acceptance, then the, the states, the governments, everyone should be doing something to lift the teacher back into the place of prominence so that the right kind of resources go into teaching. As it is, it is those who cannot get into degree programs to study something else that end up going to college of education. So you score 110, which is 25% in JAM. 110 over 400 and your first choice, the only choice that's available to you is college of education. So if we want the resources to flow back into the spaces where they need to be like you've asked, we need to fundamentally address the concept of what is a teacher and what should that teacher's remuneration be? What's the place of the teacher in our society? And if you don't revert that, then you're trying to, you're trying to kind of like, um, what's, what, how was it, what's, the, what's the phrase again? Make water run up instead of yeah. going down. You, you so, did address it. You know, even yeah. I was like trying to preempt yeah. you. Your I mean, I, you agreed to the well, yes. I mean, uh, Someone said that the mistake of an engineer dies with him. Um, the mistake of a doctor who made a surgical work um, mistake dies with him and the patient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the mistake of a teacher dies with the society. Yes. And that's something that um, we're here to grasp as a nation. I think that uh, when we started a program a couple of years ago, we never thought that we would get the kinds of responses that we're getting now. And that is to enlist Nigeria's young top talent to go back into teaching for two years in the most undeserved school. Um, but what we found out actually is that there are seemingly a huge amount of young Nigerians who really want to contribute, you know, to addressing this issue. So um, what we're doing basically is putting the right person in the right classroom. And like I said earlier, leadership is a key. And uh, once you put leadership in the, midst, in the midst of all this problem, it begins to tackle some of these challenges. Uh, so, so far so good. We've been trying to work with young Nigerians to go back into teaching in the classroom and then influencing not just the kids in their classroom, but the teachers that exist in those schools. And then you have this chain reaction happening in that school community and bringing about change, not just academically, but on also non-academic outcomes as we pursue. Something that. is being done. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming on the news. Thank you.